want to welcome you to the All Bugs webinar today, uh, Controlling Roaches Before They Control You, and we're glad to have you. Today, our speakers are Faith Boy of the University of Florida. She's an entomologist. Um, and we also have Janet Hurley, who is an extension uh, specialist dealing with school IPM from Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Thank you all both for uh, presenting today, and I will turn it over to Faith. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we're going to talk about controlling cockroaches before they control you. And here are the objectives that we have today. We want to know why controlling cockroaches is important, some of the most important species, and we're going to kind of split, up, split those up into broad groups talk a little bit about the basic biology and the context of control, go over some real life scenarios, um, and then summarize with some things to remember and have a Q&A session at the end. So why we don't want cockroaches in our kitchens or even anywhere near us. Really, um, these pictures here are of uh, salmonella that are attached to the spiny legs of a German cockroach, or actually it's an American cockroach, I'm sorry. Really, the most important, it's really the asthma and allergen aspect of cockroach infestations. That disease transmission portion is less certain. So in, in one way or another, we do definitely want to control them. We know that cockroach control alone can significantly reduce allergen levels. And sometimes um, it can be a little bit difficult to get control, especially if there's clutter. So you're going to hear some themes throughout this um, webinar today. One is going to be about the, the health effects of cockroach infestations. Another is going to be the importance of eliminating clutter and how we can address that with clientele. Um, other things that we're going to hit on today, it's really important to monitor. And monitoring is going to be your eyes 24-7. And when you know where the cockroaches are, you can place your baits appropriately. You want to place your baits where the cockroaches live. You don't want to put stuff in the middle of the wall, and we've seen some of that before. So um, let me jump in here to a little bit of ID. So we have two groupings of cockroaches. One, we call them the peridomestic cockroaches. Those are the ginormous ones. If you live here in Florida, nobody really has cockroaches. They call them palmetto bugs. So these would be the palmetto bugs that you see outside. And the other one, which is actually more concerning, I think, for us, would be our domestics. Our German cockroaches, definitely, every once and again, we'll see brown banded. But these two cockroaches here, the German and the brown banded, live almost exclusively with man. So I have a couple of factor fiction slides. Do cockroaches have high fecundity? You know, let's use our chat box to kind of keep engaged. I really appreciate you guys being here on a Friday afternoon. So. Somebody tell me, do they have high fecundity? B, I see you in there. <laughs> okay. Um, and they have what we call a gradual metamorphosis. And that becomes important when we start talking about what kinds of um, controls we can use. So the German cockroach, here's what I want you guys to take notice of. Very fast life cycle. One oothic about every 30 days. She can produce about eight OTK in her lifetime for a total of about 320 offspring. So there are about 30 or 40 eggs in each of those OTK. Now, the American cockroach, on the other hand, has only about 12 eggs. It's a bigger cockroach, but it has fewer eggs in that egg case, in that OTK. It, however, it can produce about one OTK or one egg case about every five days. And here's why. That American cockroach female she just pastes that egg case on the side of a wall. There's not that same amount of maternal care. So she can produce about 30 ootika in her lifetime for about 360 um, offspring. So in a cockroach's lifetime, whether it's a German cockroach or the American cockroach, you're still talking numbers in the 300s, um, even if they have different reproductive strategies. So here's a really um, simplified version of the German cockroach life cycle. So here you'll see this egg case. And generally, the female carries that egg case. And there's some really important implications for um, her carrying that egg case. There'll be about six nymphal instars here. And the nymphs don't have any wings. 
Oftentimes, when we get called into a pest control situation, we're going to see these nymphs, and there's not really a, a good um, identification key for them, but the German cockroach nymphs have these little light spot dots here as, as, they, um, as they go through their life cycle. And then you get, end up with the adult here. Oh. So the German cockroach, I don't care where you go in the world, this German cockroach is going to have two stripes down its pronotum here. Um, they're going to be about half inch, maybe a little bit longer. The female is going to be broader, notice how I put that in quotes, broader on the end here compared to the male. And this Otica she carries with her. These cockroaches have, have um, come to live almost in complete association with man. So. This part here is really important. Wherever that female cockroach goes, if she's gravid, if she's carrying that egg case, that is where those nymphs are going to hatch as well. So if you're having these German cockroaches traveling in, in or throughout a structure and you have gravid females, this is one way that these German cockroaches can spread and it will make um, control many times more difficult. All right, so we talked about this a little bit, survival. It, it facilitates the movement um, within a structure. So I want to talk about some behavioral and physiological traits here. These German cockroaches, I'm really going to hone in the German cockroaches now, but the German cockroaches avoid light and air movement. So they also groom, they aggregate, and they prefer high humidity. The grooming and the aggregation are important behaviors um, when we start talking about control methods. You see these, um, I don't know if you can see these um, dark spots here on the picture on the right hand side. These are what we call fecal focal points. In cockroach feces, there's an aggregation pheromone and what that pheromone does is it lets other cockroaches know, hey come here, this is a really good place to hang out. It's probably optimal for our reproduction, and you can probably get some really good food here too. So the heavier this, these fecal focal points are, are the more you know, um, the more cockroaches are in that area. Oh, let me go back here. So what that means for us is sanitation becomes really important because if you wipe down these fecal focal points and you eliminate those pheromonal cues, cues the way that these cockroaches find these optimal living spaces, um, the harder it is for them to find a good place to hang. One of the places that cockroaches like to hang out in are spaces that are vertical, believe it or not. So way back in the 20s, um, this uh, researcher named Willie, for, for some reason, was really fascinated about that space that cockroaches um, would hang out in, the optimal space, and he set up some jars with uh, wooden placards with different spacings in between. And he found that with the horizontal placards, about 67% per of the cockroaches that he had in test gathered in that 4.8 millimeter space. So in my mind, I have a hard time visualizing what exactly 4.8 millimeters is. Turns out to be about six credit card width. Is that what it is, um, that width? For whatever reason, these German cockroaches really like that vertical orientation, and about 85% of the cockroaches in that, in that test that he started um, ended up in that 4.8 millimeter space. So what this tells us is it's really important if you have a heavy German cockroach infestation to seal, um, seal up those spaces to exclude cockroaches from an area. All right, so where can we find German cockroaches and what kind of space? So I kind of, we do a lot of inspections in schools. Janet and I both um, have a real love for working in the schools. And here you can see German cockroaches. Can you see that those German cockroaches? This is a functioning kitchen, folks. Thank you. Can you see that close up? If you lift the escutcheon plate there, the reason that I saw that was I saw antennae sticking out from the bottom of those escutcheon plates, and they were washing trays in that sink. Mm. So spaces of all kinds become important. Hey, Mom. 
what can it mean if you see German cockroaches out like this during the day? Does anybody want to type into the to the box box there? Hmm. I'm giving a couple seconds to see some. I see Mallory typing. David Chang is typing. If you see cockroaches out during the day, and remember what their optimal space is, it's that, you know, 4.8 millimeters there. That means the infestation is really bad. That's right, Mallory. Um, it means you do have a bunch. It likely, likely means that all those really good spaces are taken up. So these other cockroaches are hanging out in the daytime. This is really unusual behavior. Okay, please fill the following information. So um, monitoring for cockroaches. This is this is awesome, right? In terms of infestation, time. So what can you learn from uh, a sticky card like this? If you had this kind of infestation, how long? Well, let's not go there with the how long question, but you can tell that this place has had a pretty good population going for a while, right? So that, so is this your image of pest control? I'm going to segue us pretty quickly into the control section here. Okay. All right. What we don't want to see these days is ye old fashioned spray um, clean out with a spray. We used to use pyrethroids, and back in the day, we used a product called The Demon, and it was fabulous. And we were able to kill hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cockroaches. And we loved The Demon so much that we kept using it over and over and over again. So somebody, can, can you type into the box and tell me what happens when you use the same product over and over and over again, because it was so marvelous for you the first time. Okay, right. It's the fast fingers I see over there. We have tremendous levels of resistance now, and we have had this kind of practice where we spray all the time and we keep using the same product because it works so well for us. Um, and we do this uh, with baits as well. We burn our products out. So pyrethroids are probably not um, the optimal method of trying to control cockroaches at this time because we do have significant levels. We can tank mix a pyrethroid with an insect growth regulator. And I'm going to talk a little bit about insect growth regulators as we get to the to the bait section All right, um, part in a little bit. Browser purchase from bakery. So I'm, excuse me, I'm getting some feedback on this side. I can hear somebody. So if you can uh, mute on that side, please. Um, so some of the problems, if you, I, I used to say this, without sanitation, it would be impossible to get control. That's not so much anymore with the baits that we have now. If you're only spraying, pretty much it is, because you're spraying on probably oily surfaces, too, that are going to compromise the efficacy of the chemical. You also want to eliminate harborage, because harborage creates a pesticide-free zone if you're trying to do this kind of application, or even if you're trying to bait. Why would those cockroaches want to come out of someplace that's really cozy? Um, one of the reasons that we don't like spraying, especially baseboard spraying, is when is the last time you've seen a self-respecting cockroach standing on a baseboard thinking to itself, hmm, I should stay here longer so I can pick up enough toxicant to kill myself. It really doesn't happen that way. And if you've actually looked at the feet of a cockroach, the points where pesticides are actually absorbed into the insect are very, very tiny. So this is not the most efficacious way to go about um, controlling, especially German cockroaches. So, see. So I'm going to start us into IPM, and what I'm going to do from here on out is we're going to talk about some IPM strategies, why some things work and some things don't, and then Janet is going to come in with um, a couple of real-life examples, and we're going to kind of tie some, tie some of these concepts together. Every time I've had somebody call with a, with a failure in controlling German cockroaches, it's because of some mistake in product selection, um, not understanding product rotation, and using products in combinations that are incompatible that have resulted in failure. So 
that's kind of the that's the direction that I'm going to go in right now in terms of the control. So IPM, we all you all who are on this conference call now, we love IPM. It's a great tool if you're on the private sector side. It's a great customer retention tool. If you're working in schools and you're working in institutions, it's a great way to build relationships because it gives you an opportunity to educate and chat with folks so that they understand how their behavior contributes to the pest problem and what they can do to also mitigate pests. But the first thing we need to do as PMPs is to identify the pest properly. So if you know what pest you're dealing with, you know a great deal about its biology and how to exploit it for pest control purposes. Then we want to come um, and, and see what kind of IPM tactics are available. So there's a difference. When you talk to academics, there's a difference between strategy and tactics. And um, the strategy is this process that we're going to talk about, and we'll talk about the tactics in a little bit. So the process, you can then, once you figure out your, your um, flow, you can apply pesticides as needed in targeted applications. Um, cracking crevice can be helpful. So what I have here, the picture on the right-hand side is a cockroach gel bait product rotation that Manatee County, every year they update it. Later on in the presentation, I have the 2016 rotation. But what this school district does with their technicians is at the beginning of the month, they get one tube of gel bait or uh, you know, a, a product, gel bait, and the supervisor, the IPM coordinator, takes back the previous month's supply so that they're using different active ingredients in their schools. And they have not had an issue with resistance because they've done a really good job about rotating their product. So we also want to select things that are at least hazardous and targeted. So let me talk about hazard and, and um, toxicity. If your, your risk is related to your exposure, so if you do a broadcast application of any kind of pesticide, your risk is much more increased compared to a targeted application of um, a pesticide, even if it's a cracking crevice. So generally, your broadcast applications carry the most risk. Your targeted bait applications have the least amount of risk. So um, you want to evaluate the effectiveness of your program as well. So we're going to put these things out. We're going to select our, we're going to go back and evaluate our program. And I see this comment from Vicky on the side. You are totally correct. Gel baits are not caulk. They're not sealant, okay? Um, don't use it like a sealant. <laughs> put things in very linear order when academia. So here's our typical IPM uh, triangle. The base is generally going to be your education and communication. And this green part here on the pyramid is going to be sanitation and cultural practices. And then you'll have your uh, mechanical control, uh, your physical and mechanical, then your biocontrol, and then pesticides at the very top, which is also the smallest piece of the pyramid. The reality is that pest control is usually called in at the height of the infestation because people wait or they don't realize that they have an infestation. So really the process of integrated pest management is not all that clean and neat. It's more like this circle where pest control is kind of in the middle and you want to have um, you want to have definitely communication between different types of groups who may be I'm, I'm hesitating about saying contributing to the problem, but generally that is what it is. So, I in my mind, pest control really and IPM really looks more like this this uh, circle diagram that we have here. So to successfully implement IPM. You want to investigate the pest problem first. So let me say a word about this. You are the PMP. Our clientele often have really excellent observations and helping to, uh, interviewing the customer can help you um, come up with a diagnosis because they can also have some very good observations. But if you're the professional, you need to make that final, final diagnosis. 
do a proper inspection. Don't rely on somebody else's word. Do not assume that the customer has identified the problem correctly. And then you can determine, in fact, whether there really is a problem. So I, I use this example here because we were doing one of the inspections, a school inspection, and there were actually six OT key around this functioning oven here. So somebody can quick do the math. If you have six OT time, times 30 to 40 nymphs in one egg case, somebody can put that up on, uh, in the chat box there. But what I also found was in the drain were maggots because while we were doing the inspection and I saw um, those OT key next to the oven, I also saw some California flies that were dead. Now, that's kind of interesting. That's another story for another day. So the other thing we want to do is investigate how the pest is getting into the structure. Um, we, especially in schools and maybe even in other areas, there's so much value to a good cardboard box. You can hold a lot of stuff in there, but you can also bring in pests like cockroaches. So at the University of Florida, we rear our German cockroaches in corrugated cardboard because, again, these insects are what we call stigmatactic. They like that space. They like to feel something on their ventral and their dorsal side. So this is something that we need to figure out pretty quick. Are people bringing it in on cardboard boxes in, gem in German cockroaches? Generally, yes. If I'd walk through, if I walk through your storage room, would I find more of these or would I find pesticides? Especially when you're dealing with German cockroaches, you really want to have a bunch of monitors available and then have them put out correctly. Um, if I walk through your, um, your area or your work area and happened upon your inspection kit, what would I find in your inspection kit? And this is a particularly well-organized one. You don't see any liquid insecticides next to the baits here because your liquid insecticides, particularly your pyrethroids, can contaminate the baits. Um, good old flashlight. They're cheap now. You can get them on Amazon for 10 or 20 bucks. Uh, the, first, the first IPM inspection flashlight that I got, I think it was only 60 lumens, but it was one of those scorpion stingray ones, and it cost me 60 bucks. But now I have a 100 lumen one. I have um, PMPs who come in with much more powerful ones than that for about the same amount of money. You want to ha also have um, mirrors, inspection mirrors, because sometimes you need them to see where cockroaches are hiding. So remember, these are really tiny beasts, and they don't need very much food to live on. So if you can find where they are underneath, um, underneath hard to reach places, then mirrors can be really helpful. So when you get old like me, sometimes knee pads can be really helpful because IPM, when you're doing those inspections, it's going to be a bunch of crawling around as well. Putty knife can help, especially if you want to um, scrape off bait. And this is kind of, this is a really nice to have. It's an electric screwdriver because if you're doing German cockroach inspections all day long, if you had to do take off screws manually, it could take you a while. This is very quick. If you have good batteries, they can be charged for a very long time. But in any case, I would, I would have a flathead and a Phillips head screwdriver in my kit because sometimes you run out of batteries. And of course, your forms and pencils for record keeping are also really important and part of an IPM program. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of the record keeping portion. So here's an approach to IPM for cockroach control. Um, sanitation is super important. So this is a dorm room, and I usually, ha I usually tell folks, your mother doesn't live here anymore when you move to the university, so you need to clean up, right? So cleaning up food and water sources creates competition with uh, baits, the, the extra food and water sources. So you want to wipe down these areas with detergent. So the detergent part becomes really important because you take off that pheromone and you eliminate or reduce the probability of having those fecal focal points. And clean with soap and water. So you know that squirty stuff that you, like Windex or something, sometimes what you do with those, it, the surface might look clean, but you've just 
spread those allergens around. So you really want to have a warm water rinse, especially if you're in an area where you know you have a German cockroach infestation. Okay, so how do you address clutter with customers? Um, have you guys ever tried to tell somebody that their stuff is clutter? What kind of response do you get when you tell somebody, this is junk, you need to get this out of here? It's probably not very good. So I usually have a picture of a yoga studio here because yoga studios are very empty because you need that space to practice. And really, I, it took me a really long time to think about this. What we want to do, when you look at all these words about how clutter is described and how it's related to chaos, people don't think about their very um, personal possessions as clutter. They want to think about it as their treasure. So what we want to emphasize with folks is to simplify their environment. And when they simplify their environment, then we can really get to the crux of the problem, which is eliminating food, water, and harborage for these cockroaches. When you have a simplified environment, and imagine just a really wide open and empty space, how easy is your inspection? And how easy is it for you to monitor compared to the initial clutter Yes, I'm saying that word with us, the initial clutter that we, um, you know, we had earlier on. Sanitation, yes, vacuums work, and flushing works. And back in the day, we used to flush with um, what, what some folks call 565, it's a pyrethrin. And we now know that a can of air, like you can get for cleaning your computer keyboard, is just as good. And here's the advantage of using canned air. Number one, it's probably cheaper than using a pyrethrin. And number two, you don't contaminate the space that you want to bait with a pyrethrin. So in the last year, I had several failures where PMP was trying their very best to do an IPM plan, but they were flushing with a pyrethrin and then baiting in the same space. And that led to failure because the cockroaches won't go and eat a contaminated bait. So while you're flushing with that canned air, if you have a HEPA vacuum and suck up those cockroaches as they emerge, you can have instant customer satisfaction because you're taking those cockroaches out of the environment right away. Exclusion is also really important for peri-domestic cockroaches. And I know Janet's going to talk a lot about the peri-domestic um, cockroaches. She had an episode this year. If you can see light through the doors, when you're on the inside, it's enough for cockroaches, those peri-domestic cockroaches to come in. All they need is about a quarter width, a quarter's width, you know, like 25 cents. This door here, there's a lot more than cockroaches that can be coming through this door. So sealing the building envelope, especially in these institutional settings, is very important. Placing baits. So here's the importance of monitoring. If you have monitors um, throughout a structure and you find uh, nymphs in one of them in a room, it's probably not necessary to bait the whole room. You might want to bait on five feet of either side of the monitor that have the nymphs in it. Now remember, cockroaches have really little feet, so they're not letting them go really, really far. So it can really increase your efficiency in terms of where you do your um, applications. We talked about product, um, product rotation and resistance here. So I want to thank Manatee County. This is 2016. Manatee is always very willing to share their product rotations with us. The numbers that you see on the side here, uh, so it's Advanced Cockroach Gel 4A. Um, and Max Force Magnum 2B, this refers to the IRAC number category. So if you haven't used IRAC yet, I encourage you to look it up. It's IRAC. It's the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee, and they actually have a free app that you can download on your iPhone. Now, when we get called into really bad infestation, oftentimes the, the females are pregnant and they're carrying Oothika, and female Gravid female cockroaches are kind of opposite of human pregnant women. So when I was pregnant with my son, I was eating everything that I could get my hands on because I was just 
ravenous. German cockroaches, German cockroach females tend to go the other way. They don't come out as they harbor it as much. They tend to eat less. So baiting as a strategy becomes not as appealing. Now, one way that you can get the female to get back to her original state of foraging farther and eating more is to introduce an insect growth regulator into the system. And an IGR causes a premature release of the oothica, and then she'll go back to her natural feeding and foraging, and you'll see increased bait consumption again. There's also evidence that German cockroaches learn the location of their food and water, thus improving their foraging ability. So here's another, here's another plug for sanitation and keeping um, your area simplified. This is just a graphic of what pesticide resistance looks like. So in any natural population, you're going to have a few individuals who um, will not die after eating a bait or being exposed to pesticides. So here are the, the black dots here. And in five generations, that gene is going to be passed on. So you'll have more of these resistant uh, individuals in the population. And within 10 generations, you know, you're going to have a pretty high level of resistance. And in fact, sometimes it doesn't even take that long. Here's the interesting thing about cockroaches. We have resistance not only to the active ingredient, but we also have this um, phenomenon called glucose aversion, where they learn that the sweet taste of glucose, they've associated it with the toxin and with death. So they somehow have been able to pass that on. And we have also glucose averse cockroaches. So how do you know if you're dealing with one of these populations? Monitor. If you put on a bait and you're still catching cockroaches, something is going on and something is not right. You need to change up what you're doing. What do we always say? If you do the same thing over and over, expecting different results, that's the definition of what? Somebody type that into the box for me, please. Okay, yes, insanity. So um, factors that uh, favor resistance, repeated use of chemicals, prolonged environmental persistence, slow release formulations, high percentage of the populations being treated. So we want to avoid these kinds of situations. Baiting can really help you with that. Sanitation is going to be key to the control of German cockroaches. And now I'm going to turn it over to my good friend, Janet Hurley. Are you there, Janet? I'm here. And I've been having fun watching the chat pod and you interact. <laughs> Okay, so drainage issues, this is something that really happens a lot, especially as Faith was telling you guys about the peri-domestic cockroaches. We call them water bugs in Texas. They call them palmetto bugs in, in Florida. So, because no one wants to say that they've got a cockroach. So let me go back again. Floor drains are typically where we see a lot of problems when it comes down to cockro American cockroaches. So to give you guys a little bit of a plumbing 101 lesson, when you have water in your, floor, in your drains, let me bring my little arrow down here, you've got water in this pipe, okay? That's how it's supposed to be day in, day out, Monday through Friday, not a big problem. What happens is when we don't have a lot of activity over the weekend, during summer break, um, you go on vacation at home, what ends up happening is due to evaporation, this water that's generally here in this gray area gets evaporated. Well, then that little cockroach that was hanging out over here in this pipe has the opportunity to walk down this and then come back up, and then they can come up any inlet that's got, that doesn't have water. Typically, it's a floor drain. Sometimes it can be a shower drain or a tub drain. Generally, it's not a toilet. But this is to give you an idea of what happens in that drain below the surface. So floor drains. <clears throat> I will tell you, and if anybody follows our school IPM newsletter in Texas, I did a story about this. Floor drains are kind of like hands. They're the nastiest places for anything to grow. They are the number one source for foodborne illnesses. They're the number one source for where pests can begin. And I'm, I mean, we could do floor drain pests all day, and we could have a variety of pests. But today we're just talking about cockroaches. But what you need to understand is 
these are the places where you might need to focus. If you're a pest control person and you're working at a, um, a place that serves adult beverages, a.k.a. the bar, these are great places where that you can have some real big problems with things coming out of the sewers. Down here on the bottom are two different devices that have been um, resurfaced. This first one is called a track guard. This is something you'd find in a plumbing supply um, store. And really what's nice about this is it was ideally set up to keep sewer gases from coming back. This one is a little bit more 21st century. It screws in. It's a little bit easier to put, put in place. And I will tell you this, I know in the marketplace, we are going to be getting more of these because this has become something that is viable for not just the pest control industry, but for plumbing altogether. So let's talk a little bit about bacterial deposits. Again, I'm glad hopefully some of you all have digested your lunch and you're not eating lunch while we're doing this. But this is what a typical drainage pipe, sewer drainage pipe looks like. Over time, the pipe builds up with organic matter. That's what this is. It can be food, it can be hair, it can be soap. It can be anything that's organic and, excuse my French, nasty. Or you can have this drain over here, and this is using not so much a chemical, but it's an enzyme. And these enzymes, what they do is they go into the floor drain and they literally remove the organic matter, taking it, making it flush down, go into the sanitary sewer and or your, um, oh, your sewage. And I can't think of the word I'm looking for, but it's the type that you have at your home. Somebody can type that in. Uh, Vicki is right, bleach does not clean, and this slide will show you why. So in this slide, this is the top of the floor. Can this Pretend like this is the top of the floor. This is a cutout. This goes down into the drain, and this goes all the way down into the floor. So when you pour bleach or water into a drain, what it does is it just flows straight down. When you use the enzyme cleaner, when you pour it down, especially if you get the foaming type, it actually starts to adhere to all of this. And as it goes in, it just doesn't flow all the way down. It literally goes through and starts cleaning that organic matter. So then it can be flushed through down into the sanitary sewer. So let's talk about a real life example. And this one was one of those things, thank you, Sally Lee, for septic tank, um, that kind of made my head, I had to scratch my head. The school that I was working with, we were scratching their head. Dr. Merchant, who I work with, was scratching his head. So we did some head scratching. So basically, this is a suburban middle school. I mean, it's in a nice neighborhood was built in 2009, it was open in 20, 2010. I gave you some square footage so you guys can get an idea for how large this building is, and I'll explain the yellow lines in a minute. But one of the things that I need to explain to, to some of y'all who do not live in the Texas area is this foundation down here. When we pour a slab, we don't just pour a slab. We have this process of what we put is cardboard carton form on top of the dirt that is generally treated for, pre-treated for termites, but we put that cardboard down and then we put concrete around it and then the cardboard is supposed to degrade over time. Think about this for a while and feel free to put those in your chat pods. But it degrades over time and allows the building to hopefully shift because we have such shifting soils. So, as I said, I would explain the yellow lines. This yellow line here and this yellow line here, this is um, a schematic of this school building. What those represent is this expansion joint that is right here. 
This is what the expansion joint looks like as it's going from one side of the building to the other. The interesting thing about this expansion joint is, is it ran the length of the building from one side of the building from the principal's office all the way to the back dock door, which was next to a mechanical room and a kitchen. The other expansion joint that ran in the, in the building actually was covered by lockers and didn't have a whole lot of extra what we referred to, and this is what I was referring to as free space. In other words, things can come up out of this. So, this is the outside exterior of this building. What we noticed is that expansion joint is right around this area. Notice the water, notice where it drains, notice there's a sprinkler head here. There's another water line here. On the other side of the building, we didn't have that, but what we ended up find, finding is this is it in the slab. I literally could shove my arm in this slab and I could also feel cold air. What does that tell you about what can get in in this area? And yeah, cockroaches could be their least of their problems. Inside, what we were noticing is we had all of these mechanical rooms because this is such a large building and there were a lot of drains. You know, again, the condensate for the AC. You know, you have your drain lines for, for other equipment. But when there's nothing going down there, because we don't run our AC 12 months out of the year, we're pretty good about six, maybe eight. But, you know, when there's nothing going down here, this becomes dried. The other part is, is making sure, even though you're an applicator and you're qualified, Sometimes you get in a hurry and you don't always do the right thing. What I was seeing was sometimes your glue boards weren't placed in the right places. Sometimes the bait stations weren't put in the right places. But more importantly, again, it was that whole baiting option that Dr. Oy was talking about of how do we do this and making sure we're using the right baits. The other employee problem and there's lots of facilities that use these wonderful cleaning, floor cleaning machines. The only problem is, is as you move these around, water gets stored up in here. Water gets stored up in here. Water gets stored up in here. Sometimes they don't empty it. Sometimes they can move the cockroaches around. So think about this. If you're having a problem in your building, and I don't care what kind of building you're dealing with, what happens when they move that machine from, say, the east side of the building to the west side of the building? Well, your problem may only have been on the east side, but now they've introduced that problem to another side of the building simply because somebody wasn't paying attention because the old model, it's not my job, does carry a lot of weight when you're, doing, when you're dealing with pest control. So solving the pest problem, the hardest part is inspections, and it's inspecting and talking. And as Faith readily said, when you get on your hands and knees and you crawl around like this, yeah, it's really good for your, your thighs and your legs, but it's really bad on your knees and your lower back. But that's the only way to see this. I can't look for cockroaches standing up 15 feet away. Looking for cockroaches requires me to be on my hands and knees and crawling and looking down. The other thing is communication, communicating with custodial staff, communicating with administrative st staff, communicating with uh, other teachers and other people who may be in the building. It may be communicating what you're doing, but it may also be listening to what they have to say. Because when we were having this problem at this building, it was listening to not just the school people, but what everybody was telling me of, well, this is what we've done, this is where we've seen them, oh, this is where we're having a problem, that I had to literally sit down and process, okay, here's all the problems, now how do we go about solving it? Because sometimes when you make your recommendations, because you need to make it make, based on good scientific knowledge, 
you sometimes have to make those recommendations knowing what are the obstacles in order to be successful. Because just because you make a pesticide application does not necessarily mean you're going to be successful. So what do we do? Behavioral changes. One of the things that we had to go in is clean up any old bait, um, drain water out of the floor machines, had to do some vacuuming, dusting, cleaning, everything. Because, again, if we were going to go in and apply something, I didn't want the roaches to, to be adverse to anything. I didn't want them to turn their noses up. You know, it's the three-year-old child mentality. You want to make it so conducive that they want to eat it. They want, you want to pretend like you're giving the cockroaches chicken nuggets. So we also did some sealing, installed some door sweeps. The big thing we did, especially in the kitchens, was installing trap guards or the green drains so that, again, what we didn't want was if we did cleaned everything else up, you sure don't want the cockroaches going to the one room that you really don't want the roaches in because all you need is one health inspector to see cockroaches in your kitchen and there's a good chance you're – you could get your kitchen closed down. So we wanted to be proactive about that. We also made some changes in the base. Um, we looked at what they were using. I made several phone calls, Dr. Oy being one of them. Um, Dr. Merchant and I worked with some, some other people here locally, figured out what they were using, changed the bait matrix, and they made applications based on the label. The interesting part was when we looked at the label, the label had um, application use re rates for low infestation, medium infestation, and high infestation. We went with medium because I really didn't think they were completely out of control. But when we made it, when we made those applications in those targeted areas, we saw a lot of control within a quick time. So what we did was, and I, I just lost my, my little arrow. This area right here where I'm showing on the green, this is the principles area. So we made sure that we did some good targeting of making of the baits here because the principles kind of like your wife or mommy, if they're not happy, nobody's happy. So we wanted to make sure we did, did that as well. There was a mechanical room over here. There was lots of mechanical rooms up in this area. Up above this area here, above these classrooms, was more mechanical areas, and there's another one over here. So we went up into the structure and made sure we did the baiting up in that area. You know, we, we did some concentrated baiting, and within two months' time, they were pretty much under control, and I've been told that that's not been a problem since. Okay. The biggest thing about IPM is engagement and involvement. People want to do something. They want to be part of proactive, but they don't always know. As Dr. Oy was saying, clutter control, people don't understand that clutter is not good, it's not healthy, there are so many things that go along with it. Might I recommend an episode of Hoarders? If you really want to see the psychology behind actually keeping stuff, the hardest thing to tell a teacher, and this is the environment that I work in most, is you've got to get rid of your stuff. But I will tell you guys, my mother is also one of those people that could, could collect a lot of things. So, again... It's getting rid of that, and it's sometimes very liberating to get rid of that stuff. But if they've got to keep stuff, get them out of cardboard, put it into, you know, the locking plastic containers. Talk about why it's so important not to have that clutter because it's very important for students. Use the asthma allergy triggers. There's a lot of things that you can do to make your environment better. And so here's your to-do list. And we're almost to our end. David Lewis just kind of told you guys one of the things. It's important to put the bait and vent sacks that that's direct access to the sewers. And I yes, 
I do remember doing that, David. But again, that's another place that some places, people don't think to go look on a roof. How often do you get up on a roof and look up there and see where there's points coming in? So be sure to teach your customers to know, identify common pests and the difference between an introduction and infestation. We were doing the bed bug talk, we would really talk about this. Um, make sure they know the appropriate contact for reporting pest sightings. It's one thing to cry and complain in the break room, it's another to send in a work order or send an email to the right contact. In schools, it could be your IPM coordinator, it could be a facility director, whomever, but make sure that that person knows what's going on. IPM is 90% people management. Our running mantra for all of us that do urban IPM is IPM takes people management. You can, yeah, you can use a chemical, but it's the people who make the difference. And then you've got to figure out what is causing that problem. It wasn't until we did some hard walking and some hard talking at that campus to figure out what the problem was, because that wasn't an introduction from somebody and they weren't just coming in because there was some mulch. It was because there was some other things going on in that building that once we realized what the problem was, all right, well, now we've got to target it, and now we need to seal, and now we need to move forward. Okay. I think this is where we need the questions. But before we go to the questions, let me just remind you, this is our Learn event. You'll be able to find this recording later. And if... If by chance you're a school person and you have not met our pest management in and around structures, then I highly recommend that you guys check this out. We do have pest management plans for both the German cockroach and for our outdoor cockroaches. So that is well-vetted information from all of us in our urban IPM team. And now I'm going to switch this over to... Um, Jane, can you put up the, there you are, the full four poll questions, and we want to thank Janet and Faith. Um, that was some great information today and super helpful. Um, if everybody will take a few minutes to fill out these four poll questions, and then also we have a uh, little bit more in-depth survey done through Paltrix, and I placed the link over in the chat box, um, but it should also pop up here in a few minutes after everyone's finished doing your poll questions. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And again, thank you, Faith and Janet. Are there any questions for our, our presenters for today? I see one question about where do you get the enzyme? Where do you get the enzyme to go down the drain? Um, the, the product can be purchased from any one of the distributors if you just ask them. Um, their DF3000 was kind of a, a, a standard, but there is um, Rockwell Labs has one, and the name just went out of my brain that works quite well in schools. And I know a lot of schools in Florida use it. So let me check on that real quick. Yes, to answer Chesterfield, those enzymes could be used for homeowners. Mm -hmm. It's invade biofoam. Yeah. Yeah. And so you can actually get it in a can that foams as well. And I think that's appealing. That's a little bit more expensive. But you can get the invade and put a foamer in it if you have a machine that can do that foaming as you apply. And to answer your question, Randall, yes. Sticky cards, not rat glue boards, just little <laughs> sticky cards. And make sure to place them properly, that the opening is not on the outside of the wall. You want to have it closer. 
Remember, they're following guidelines. These pets are all following guidelines. And don't stick them in the middle of the wall because it's too hard to get down to the baseboard. See that too. Um, can you say again what it was with the bait when they're using the gel? I know you said about, or someone said about the size of a pinhead, um, but how many places would you place that pinhead drop of gel, like in a 10 by 10 foot area, or is it just based on the amount of infestation you have as to how many bait stations you would have? Okay, so the, the label for these baits tell you to put out pea sized dots. But I will tell you, if you're in a very heavy infestation, my colleagues, I have, um, some of you may know Dini Miller. She works in a lot of um, housing authority type situations. She creates what they call cannolis. So she cuts pieces of wax paper and puts like, it's got to be a quarter of a tube of bait. And then what that wax paper does too is it, it, it protects the surface that you're trying to put that bait on. And then she leaves it out, and I'm telling you, man, I, I've there are a lot of dead cockroaches in the cops that she goes to. I've seen her, um, I've seen her photos of the befores and afters, and um, that that seems to work really well for high levels of infestations. But you want to put that out of reach of children and um, pets and whatnot if you're going to do it that way. The pea size. For moderate infestations is fine, places where you might historically have a cockroach problem, but it's going to desiccate much more quickly than something that has more. Okay, do we have any other questions? And please do remember to take that Qualtrics survey. Lucy has posted it again in the chat box. Well, thank you, everyone, and have a great weekend.